In the Middle Ages, how much leisure time a person had would depend heavily upon their social status. Because they had such a favoured position in life, and many servants to fulfil their every need, medieval royalty had lots of free time that they could just fritter away. They could also afford to pay for the best activities for themselves, and for any guests who they needed to entertain. Let's travel back in time and have a look at what the medieval royalty did for fun during the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. A hunting we will go. An important pastime that was seen not only as enjoyable and a way of providing food, but also as preparation for war, was hunting. Many members of the nobility kept horses and dogs just for this purpose, and spent large sums of money on specially bred packs of hounds. Royals and nobles also simply kept dogs as pets, unlike the poorer classes who used them for herding and for protection. The aristocracy of the Middle Ages were a warrior class, and when not at war, hunting identified them as the military elite. Hunting was also essential in establishing the king's power, and improving the strength of a kingdom. William the Conqueror began the Royal Forest, which was not necessarily a wooded area, but rather a hunting reserve, which included large expanses of arable land as well. Hunting in a royal forest was forbidden to all but the king, and whomever he nominated as eligible. William and his sons were said to be devoted to hunting, and William, quote, loved stags as much as if he were their father. However, we can assume that he didn't go out and shoot his sons with a bow and arrow. Hunting in the forest was a privilege that only the highborn could enjoy, and games such as red, fallow and roe deer, wild boars and hares were protected by the royal monopoly. Wild boars were prized for their meat, and because they were a dangerous quarry due to their size, strength and sharp tusks. Unlike boars, bears were hunted just for sport, so much so that they were extinct in England early in the medieval period, but continued to be hunted in Europe. Like the boar, bears were obviously dangerous. In 1391, the French Count of Foy, Gaston Phoebus, died because of the excursions of a bear hunt. He was known as one of the greatest huntsmen of the time, and wrote a manual called Book of the Hunt, which was all about his favourite pastime. Hunting clothes worn were probably made from the rich furs and expensive silks that the nobles wore at the time, although Gaston does state that hunters should generally wear green and grey in the winter. Hawking Falconry was another pastime that could only be afforded by the rich. Eagles, falcons, and hawks were trained by falconers to hunt other birds and small game. The skills required to teach a bird to hunt on command in this way took years, making the birds a substantial investment. The falconer took a young bird from its nest and raised it by hand. It was taught to perch on the falconer's hand, fly off to hunt prey, and then return. The training was painstaking and expensive, and the birds had to be housed in special cages. In the 1270s, King Edward I had a building built at Charing Cross for his falconers, and no expense was spared, with an aqueduct carrying fresh water to the bird bath. The birds were fed on doves that were also reared on site, and the raptors were given cranes to practice on. A resting bird's head was covered in a hood to keep it calm, and the hawks were attached to perches by leather or silk strings called jesses. Hoods were embroidered and lavishly decorated, and jesses might even have bells and jewels attached. Both hunting and falconry were a form of entertainment for the members of medieval royalty. Large hunting parties were often held so that the king could show off his skills and amuse his guests, and hawking was one of the few outdoor pursuits that was popular among noble women as well as men. Tournaments a favourite pastime of both nobles and royalty, jousting was popular between the 10th and 15th centuries. Tournaments were held to celebrate everything from marriages and coronations to visits from overseas dignitaries, as it was a perfect way for kings to conduct political manoeuvrings with foreign allies. The tourney was also a way to keep knights at the peak of their fighting prowess during peacetime. In 1390, Richard II organised a joust to impress his new associates from the French House of Valois. Held over three days in October, men came from France, Zealand, and Germany, bringing with them the best horses and appropriate arms. The romantic image that has endured over the centuries is one of knights fighting to impress beautiful ladies. In reality though, jousting was a highly dangerous sport. 
It took years of training before a combatant was ready to compete at tawny level, but the spoils were worth it. A champion knight could win a considerable amount of prize money. In the early Middle Ages, knights were also allowed to claim the weapons and armour of their fallen challenger. Days before a tournament began, knights would arrive in the area displaying their coat of arms in the window of their lodgings. Lists were published beforehand naming the contestants, the rules, the style of combat allowed, and the accepted types of weapons. Watched on by the king, queen, and other nobles, the herald would signal the start of a joust. The horses charged towards one another, each ridden by a knight armed with a lance. It was a fast-paced and exciting sport to watch, waiting for one of the opponents to be struck, unseated, and knocked from his horse. It was also highly dangerous, and bones were regularly broken from falls and blows from the lance. In 1379, the Earl of Salisbury accidentally killed his own son during a tournament. Minstrels A royal household would have its own troupe of entertainers, who would travel everywhere with the court. King Henry V of England took his minstrels to war with him in France, and paid them 12 shillings per day, which was twice as much as an archer's wages. Equal in rank to royal falconers and huntsmen, the minstrels of the royal court were anything but humble servants. The musicians' instruments may have included cymbals, flutes, horns, tubers, and harps. It was traditional for minstrels to play the harp whilst telling stories. Both Henry and his queen, Catherine of Valois, were champions of the discipline, both being able to play the harp themselves. It wasn't uncommon for medieval royalty to play instruments, as they had a lot of free time in which to practice. Most noble women were expected to be skilled in playing at least one. As well as music, the minstrels may have entertained with tricks such as juggling, balancing, tumbling, dancing on stilts, or performing with animals. In 1306, Edward Longsharks arranged a celebration for his son's knighting, the future Edward II. He employed 175 minstrels for the occasion, and 27 of them were members of the royal household. The only woman who was paid as a minstrel was an acrobatic dancer who went by the dubious name of Matilda Makejoy. Of course, the royal court would also have its own jester, who would have told stories and provided comic relief. Dances such as the carol dance performed by a circle of dancers, the basset and the pavan would be enjoyed both before, during, and after banquets. Display dancing also became popular at English courts during the late medieval period, after it was introduced from France and Italy. Girls just wanna have fun. The royal household would have its own chaplain known as a chancellor, and their castle would have its own chapel where the family would pray every morning. As the king would be busy during the day, attending meetings, hearing petitions, passing laws, hunting, and generally doing other kingy things, his queen and her entourage would need to entertain themselves in other ways. Board games were popular, especially chess, which would require one's full attention, and could go on for hours. Other board games included Fox and Geese, the philosopher game, and an early form of backgammon known as tables. Card games also required strategy and skill. King Charles VI of France had a court painter decorate cards for his own use in 1393, and it soon became popular across the whole of late medieval Europe. The cards themselves were made from either wood, ivory, or parchment, with the images painted on by hand. They were beautiful and extremely costly to produce. Incidentally, the image of the Queen that is used in England today on all standard playing cards is adapted from a portrait of Elizabeth of York. She was the wife of the first Tudor monarch, King Henry VII, and daughter of King Edward IV. It is the White Rose of York that she is seen holding in her hand. Sewing and embroidery work using fine silks and gold thread were thought to be a suitable pastime for noble women. They would demonstrate their fine needlework on bags, belts, girdles, and garters not because of necessity of employment or the need of wages, but for the sheer pleasure of it, and because fine needlework was considered among a woman's finest accomplishments. A good book. The medievals accepted that literature could be both informative, as well as being enjoyed for the pure pleasure of it, and this helped to produce a demand for reading matter in the later Middle Ages. Several genres were fashionable, including romances, devotional works such as Book of Hours and Books of Saints, ballads, histories, and chronicles. The reading of literature was a popular pastime among the wealthy, especially with the ladies who had more leisure time. Of course, the most deluxe copies of books were only made for and could only be afforded by royalty. 
The reading of English chivalric romances was a common hobby because of the popularity of the Arthurian legend. King Edward III of England was thought to have been influenced enough to establish the Order of the Garter after reading the chivalric poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And when Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote the History of Kings of Britain in the 1130s, this only added further fame to the King Arthur legend. A member of royalty would of course be able to commission special books with instructions for the binding, number of pages, and illustrations within it. In the late 15th century, Mary of Burgundy owned a book of hours in which she had a page illustrated with her own portrait, and Catherine of Cleves had a book of hours commissioned in the 1440s in the Netherlands. A queen might pass time by walking in the garden, speaking with her ladies or other noble women. Perhaps discoursing the current affairs of the time, discussing fashions, or just generally gossiping. Elite ladies often had lapdogs that wore collars with little bells to distinguish them from hunting dogs. Other pets included caged songbirds and even squirrels, which were kept to help noble ladies pass the time. It is testament to the strength of appeal of many of these pastimes such as board and card games, reading, and embroidery that they are still popular today, centuries later. And fortunately, they are now available to the majority of people rather than just the rich. However, unfortunately, this does mean that I have an addiction to playing chess on my phone. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. We do hope you've enjoyed it, and please do subscribe if you enjoy the content, as we have some pretty exciting things coming soon that we're really excited to share with everyone. Thank you, and I hope you all have an amazing weekend. Cheers!